Today is Good Shepherd Sunday, as we can see in today's gospel reading. It mentions, or our Lord mentions, that he is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. In other words, he cares so much about us that he's even willing to give his life for us. And so we should trust him completely. We should entrust ourselves and our lives to him. And I think the real question that we ought to ponder is, are we doing this? And are we doing it as far as we should. In other words, not only do we entrust ourselves to him, but are we following his commands in our lives? Are we striving to live as he calls us to? So this is the, the question that we ought to ponder. You've probably heard the saying, there's nothing new under the sun. It's a common saying. You probably heard it. It's actually biblical. It's from the from the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter one. So from the book of Ecclesiastes, it mentions that, you know, all is vanity and there's nothing new under the sun. Things are always the same in many ways from, from the point of view of, of the world. Sure, different things happen, but it's happened before and it will happen again. So there's nothing new under the sun. There was a philosopher by the name of Protagoras who lived more than 400 years before the time of Christ. And he made the statement that man is the measure of all things. Man is the measure of all things. And basically what that means is that not so much that man measures all things and learns all things, but rather man determines for himself what is the measure of all things. In other words, the meaning of all things. And of course, this is a wrong view. So the correct view is that God is the source of all truth. God has created the world in a certain way with certain laws of, of nature, you know, such as gravity and the speed of light and how elements interact with each other. And it is up to us as human beings, so, so it's up to scientists to, to investigate nature and to to find out some of the things that God has placed into nature as certain rules or laws in nature. And of course, this is pretty obvious to everyone, but what's not so obvious is that this also applies to human nature and uh, human morality. In other words, human morality is not something that we create of our own will. Now, it is true that we can enact certain laws or governments can enact certain laws. So morality can and does change. But ultimately, we get our sense of right and wrong from God. So within each one of us, we have a sense of right and wrong. So in every culture, in every age, people can recognize that it is wrong to kill an innocent human being, especially an innocent child. Now, there might be reasons as to why in certain cultures they did this. Sometimes they would offer their own children to the gods in order to, to have the, the, the blessings of the gods that they believed in and things like that. But they recognized that it was a huge sacrifice, that it was wrong in general. Or take, for example, um, that in every country when, let's say, people are going to war, Someone who is a coward, in no country would we esteem that person and say, oh, that person is, is a good person for being a coward. If he had good reasons for not engaging in battle, you know, that's understandable. But someone who's just a plain old coward, in no culture would we esteem that person. We esteem people who are heroic, self-sacrificing, self-giving. And this is common to every culture. So in other words, we all agree in certain moral principles. So human morality is something objective. It's something that comes to us from God, is something that is given to us by God. So in other words, there is a moral law, which we can all recognize. And if there is a moral law, there has to be a moral lawgiver, which we would call God. Now, in recent times, the principle of Protagoras that I have mentioned, or that phrase, man is the measure of all things, it's kind of uh, become more prevalent in today's society again. 
So in other words, man determines for himself what is right and wrong. And of course, this has a lot to do with mankind turning away from God. And there's a kind of history of how, uh, leading up to, to modern times, how different philosophers and even scientists were influential in this mentality that we can determine for ourselves what is right and just, that we are our own gods in a sense. So the theory of evolution had a lot to do with this. And notice I emphasize theory of evolution. To this day, it is just a theory. So many people, once they began to believe in the theory of evolution, they believed, well, mankind just evolved naturally by natural processes, by chance, evolution. In other words, there is no designer. There is no God. This just happened by chance. And many people believe this. And if this is the case, then really it's the survival of the fittest. So those who are in positions of authority, well, they would argue, well, they are the fittest and the people under their care, well, they're kind of dispensable. And we see how this kind of mentality influenced certain uh, political ideals or political movements, such as communism, for example. So under communism, you know, the, the idea of communism is very good. And to this day, it appeals to many people. And, you know, um, my nephew said that his, his, one of his teachers is even teaching communism as a good. So in principle, yes, it means sharing wealth and everybody is equal. Sounds wonderful. But in reality, it doesn't work out that way because this principle denies the reality that we have a fallen human nature. And there's a saying that power corrupts. The more power that you have, the more corrupt you will become. So what happened under communism is that, yes, they, they took away the wealth from those who had wealth and they didn't dis distribute it amongst the poor, but rather those who were in positions of power kept most of the wealth for themselves. So yes, they did give some of it, you know, uh, to the people. So they took care of some of the people, but they were concerned about rebellion. In other words, they wanted to establish their kingdom here on earth and their political kingdom. And whenever there was opposition, they just opposed them. And so under communism, it's been estimated that over 200 million people have been killed over communism just in the last century. And we know that terrible things continue in places like China, where if you rebel, if you speak out against the establishment, you are taken away, you are thrown in prison, maybe your organs are harvested, who knows what happens to you. So these political systems that say that everybody is equal and that everybody is to be treated with respect, are actually false and deceptive because in reality, that's not what we see happening. Or take, for example, under Nazism, this belief in evolutionary theory led to the idea, well, we are a super, super race or the Germans, some Germans thought that and they considered the Jews to be kind of a pestilence, and they, it was forbidden to interbreed with the Jewish people. People were actually told that, you know, if you uh, associate with the Jewish people, you will catch diseases from them. So there was this, this prejudice that was developed against the Jewish people, and not just the Jewish people, but against gypsies, people who had deformities, people who were handicapped. So all of these people, as we know, were shipped off and they were killed. So yes, six million Jews were killed, but it's estimated that there were 20 million of others who were also killed by the Nazis. So this idea of, of mankind being the measure of all things and determining what is right for himself or for their country or even for the world. In other words, if they believe in evolutionary theory, well, why not manipulate the human genome? Why not create a super race? And these ideas are actually coming back, especially when we talk about the fourth industrial revolution or the Great Reset or, or Agenda 2030. So this is part of their, their plans. So as I mentioned before, you know, having the one world government is not necessarily bad. But who's the one who's going to be in charge? And even if it's a good person, there's that saying that power corrupts. In regards to the idea that, you know, man is the measure of all things, even in regards to morality, we see the extreme.
extreme to which this, this has gone in today's age. In other words, traditionally, when a child was born, the doctor would say, congratulations, you have a, a baby boy or you have a baby girl. But today, it's almost like, well, congratulations, you have a child. We don't know what it is. We'll have to wait until the child matures and then determines what gender it is based out of a choice of about 46 possible genders, or I don't know how many there are out there. So in other words, we are denying reality. In fact, there was a, a philosopher or, or um, uh, someone recently made the statement, a modern philosopher, that if you think it, it is. In other words, reality is whatever you make it to be. And there's this movement also in the new age, which is, which is not good, the power of positive thinking. If you just think something, it will come about. Now, it's true, we have to think positively, but we have to trust in God, not in our ability to think and to create things. So hopefully we can understand and see that all these things are not good. And, you know, gender confusion is a terrible thing for young people. You know, I remember reading a story about a young girl who comes home crying and, and the mother says, you know, what's the matter? And, and the child, the young girl says, you know, my teacher told me that maybe I'm not a girl. And the child is very confused. So in other words, children shouldn't be taught these things. Uh, and it's often what happens is, is children are promoted by parents or grandparents to kind of assume a certain identity, which goes against nature. But it goes along with this mentality that people think that they can just create and be whatever they want to be. But we cannot. So man is not the measure of all things. God is. God is the one who determines what is right and wrong. And as the, the Bible tells us, God is unchanging. So we are the ones who change the laws of God. Just because government leaders say that mar marijuana is now legalized, it doesn't mean that it's good. In fact, it's bad. So in, in places, in states where they have legalized marijuana, um, crime rate has increased as well as traffic accidents. In other words, more people are being harmed because of this. If governments really cared about us, they wouldn't enact such laws. So when we understand this, then the question we ought to ask is, well, are we just trusting government officials or even health officials or the media? as many people do. In other words, their source of information is the media, the television, what politicians are saying, what health officials are saying, what the so-called experts are saying. But no, we need to look to God. And this, this whole, um, you know, man is the, is the measure of all things, this whole relativistic attitude is also one that has influenced the church. So we see in the church greater disobedience. We see even amongst the hierarchy. We see in the church um, people at all levels of authority changing what Christ has established and arguing, well, it's not really the words of Christ. It's really just the apostles. They had these ideas at that time, but we now know better and we have better ideas than they do. And we see bishops opposing each other. You know, there's a saying in, in traditional circles, lex orandi, lex credendi, and some, some would add lex vivendi. So these are Latin phrases for the law of prayer or the law of worship is the law of belief, is the law of life. In other words, all of these three are interconnected. I just want to focus on lex credendi, lex orandi. So the law of belief is the law of worship or the law of prayer. In other words, what we believe is going to affect how we worship. If we really believe in the Eucharist, we will want to adore our Eucharistic Lord. We will observe the re required fast before communion. We will truly honor our Lord. And, and if we believe that it's truly our God, it makes sense to kneel down, to receive on the tongue, all these things. On the other hand, how we practice, in other words, if we're just sloppy with the mass, 
giving the impression that we don't care, or if people just receive as if it were just a potato chip, then that practice of worship affects what you believe. And this is why many people argue that, you know, before the Second Vatican Council, before a lot of these changes that were not called by the Second Vatican Council, people had more faith. People really believed in our Lord's true presence in the Eucharist. The number of occasions was quite high. After a lot of these changes happened, people stopped believing in the Eucharist. The number of vocations diminished, decreased, and the number of people leaving the church increased. The number of atheists in the world also increased. Now, part of the reason I bring this up also is that you know that some people are um, taking a petition to move the tabernacle to the center. So traditionally, the tabernacles were in the center to remind us that God is the measure of all things, that we need to obey God, that we need to worship God, that we need to submit ourselves to God completely. And some people would argue, well, this is the way the church was designed architecturally. It makes sense. And yeah, we can we can make that argument. But some of these people, you know, when there's other architectural changes, you know, for example, the bell tower, you know, it's not the way it was originally designed, or we plan to change the parking lot and, and move the curb further up. And they're not opposed to these changes. So it's not a question of original design versus something else. Now, they could argue, well, this is more aesthetic. This is more closer to, to our actual worship. And that's true. But if you think about it, you know, the, the three chairs here, you know, I say it's reserved for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, if you notice where those three chairs are, it's the highest point in the church. And it's central. And in many churches, the priest would sit there. Now, I, I don't want to sit there because I believe that God should be central. And I like the idea of working with parishioners, working together. So certain times I might put my foot down and say, no, it has to be this way. But in most cases, I've gone along with what most people wanted. In fact, sometimes I disagreed and I said, okay, well, we'll do it your way. But in other words, people who argue, well, this is how it's architecturally designed and this is how it should be. Basically, what they are saying is, you, Father, should be in charge of us you, Father, should be as if you were sitting in the center there and just dictating to us the way things should be. So I, I don't agree with that, and hopefully you don't either. You know, the one of the other changes after the Second Vatican Council, which the council did not call for, is the priest turning and facing the people. In other words, going behind the altar. So instead of all of us worshiping God and looking towards God, now when people look up, they see the priest. So the priest becomes the authority. The priest is the one who guides the people, in many ways entertains the people, as in modern places. Now, here's a very interesting thing I wanted to read to you from the Catechism, and it's the section uh, under the church's ultimate trial. And I have read this before, but I wanted to reiterate a different aspect of it. So this is Article 675 from the Catechism. Before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo-messianism by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. So, a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. So you have to apostatize, you have to abandon your faith, you have to conform with what is politically correct or what the government officials want. And some people are worried that we're actually headed to this state because there's greater control over society. People are losing their freedoms, including the freedom of speech. 
also Derek Sloan, who's a government official, you know, and various others have pointed out that the lockdowns cause more harm than good. Derek Sloan recently made a statement that, you know, in many countries, many scientists have, have pointed out that, you know, increasing vitamin D, vitamin zinc, all of these things can help to boost a person's immune system and potentially protect that person from the coronavirus. But he's silenced and he's told, no, this is just baloney. This is just conspiracy theorists saying these things, whereas in reality, it's scientific fact. In fact, Anthony Fauci takes 8,000 ICU of, of vitamin D on a daily basis. So um, you're only recommended one. Some people take more. I think it's encouraged to take more. But he takes eight um, you know, capsules, which is 8,000 ICU. So in other words, he obviously knows that there's a tremendous benefit to vitamin D. There is one doctor who said, you know, in the wintertime, the reason people get sick isn't so much uh, because of the cold, the winter, but rather because they're deprived of vitamin D because we're not exposed to the sun and there's very little sunshine in the wintertime. So in other words, truth is, is being suppressed. Freedom of speech is being suppressed. And in many uh, countries already, they've introduced the vaccine passport. And without it, you won't be able to buy or shop. In other words, once that is in place, they will have total control over you. And then they can say, well, even in regards to morality, if you as a religious organization don't accept this, 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 or that, we have to shut you down. And we will have no choice. So this is something we should definitely oppose. So the supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo-messianism, a false messianism, a false message of salvation, a false salvation by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. In other words, move God away from the center, place man there, Man glorifies himself. We see this in the scientific world, in the political world. Man thinks they can control themselves, control society, control the world, and become a kind of savior of the world. You know, Bill Gates, interestingly enough, in one of his TED Talks, he actually admitted that, you know, there's a real threat of global warming. We need to reduce world populations. And he mentions various things that they're using to, to do that. And he mentioned that they're also doing it by means of vaccines. So in certain countries previously, in the Philippines, in India, and in places in Africa, people were given immunization shots for various things. And they actually were sterilized without being told that this was a side effect of these vaccines that they were being given. So he actually admitted this. Uh, on a TED talk, it may have been a slip of the tongue, I don't know, but we ought to be very concerned. In other words, who are we placing our trust in and why? Do we really trust God? Is God our shepherd? You know, our sheep, we, sheep are, are not very bright animals. We easily stray from the flock. We easily get into trouble. So in other words, the sheep must always keep their eyes on the shepherd. How do we do this? By having a regular routine of prayer, reading the scripture, especially the New Testament, knowing our faith and being strong in our faith. And uh, if we do this, then we have greater protection from God, greater um, inspirations also from the Holy Spirit. So the question we ought to ponder, as I mentioned at the beginning, is Christ or is God really our true shepherd or are we following merely human beings and putting our trust and confidence in them alone and not enough in God.